I got it. I got it. I got to go. Come on, grab your Bible, grab your study notes. Um, let's dive into this. We are continuing. We're continuing our series on prayer. Uh, we've been we've been on prayer. This is prayer 108. Um, and we have been on prayer. We've been studying prayer. Uh, but I'm grateful that we just haven't been on prayer. But prayer has messed around and got on us. Prayer has messed around and got on us, man. And we want you uh, to get let that prayer get on you. We've been praying every day as a church at 12 noon. And we, we don't want you to lay prostrate. We don't want you speaking in tongues. No, you're you on them for a job, man. And we need them. We don't need you leaving. We don't need you losing that job. We need them tithes. Amen. So don't don't lose your job now. But we're just going to bow your head or, or just say a prayer under the breath. They don't get fired. Talking about pastor want me to pray. And that's how I shot. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Just just go on break or, or do something else. Don't, don't, don't do that. No, we we don't need we don't need we don't need you doing that. Amen. Amen. So but but we praying we're praying together every day at noon, high noon, um, just as a corporate body. And I believe God is really preparing us for what we're gonna do as we move forward into the new year, as as we um can as we genuinely um begin the new year with a twenty one day prayer and consecration and we pray every morning. Um, and then we also pray every every evening. So I want I want us to get a running start on that um, and just get in on our intercessory prayer, our prayer line and all that kind of stuff, um, because God is doing something and grab a hold of these teachings. We walk through uh, what we call the model prayer uh, where Jesus said, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be his name, his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, and we forgive our debt to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. That's what we spent seven uh, or so weeks um, talking about, but now we're going to move forward, and what we're going to do, we're kind of going to be cherry-picking through the Word of God and grabbing other powerful um, scriptures that deal with prayer, um, and then uh, eventually what we're going to do, we're going to kind of tackle some different types of prayer, or I may just intertwine it uh, in, in these messages that God has us talking about, but I'm excited about prayer. Now, let me read this verse of scripture, Ephesians chapter 3, um, verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. <coughs> It says, so I ask you not to lose heart. I don't want you to lose heart over what I'm suffering, what the Apostle Paul says. They don't lose heart over what I'm suffering. He says, I'm suffering for you. Look what he says, which is your glory, which is your glory. We're going to park there and we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing um, to this church at Ephesus, and, and he's um, simply pouring his heart out and giving them a revelation that God has given him as it relates to who the people of God really are. Uh, but Paul isn't writing to this church or just um, like how he wrote to some churches, some letters that he wrote. He never visited that particular place. He never was there. But no, here when you study the book of Ephesians, you're looking at literally uh, the heart of a pastor writing a letter to people in whom he's grown to love and to know, and he has a relationship with them. If you look in, the, in Acts chapter 18, we're not going to turn there, but in Acts chapter 18, the Apostle Paul, he spent, uh, he spent over two years um, teaching and preaching the word of God to these individuals in Ephesus. He spent there for two full years, Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 19. Really, we get a chance because it is, it is a moving, it's a moving passage when he um, told them that he have to depart. He told them that he have to leave. And here they were not, they were not upset with one another, but no, the Apostle had to go on and continue to carry the gospel throughout the known world and when he got to the point where he had to transition and leave the Bible says he called the elders to a particular place and they were literally crying because they did not want to see the apostle Paul go because he had such an impact on their lives that their life was better as a result for being in relationship with the apostle Paul and can I tell you that there must be someone in your life that your life should be the better because God has hooked you up with a man or a woman of God God, and such is the case with the Apostle Paul. So some time has transpired from Acts chapter 18 and 19, several years, and now God inspires Paul's heart, and God speaks to him in a way that he wants him to write them a letter, and the letter is so powerful. The book of Ephesians is put there simply for us to be able to know who God has told us that we are in him. 
and how we ought to walk that thing out. The first three chapters, it's six chapters, the first three chapters are very, are very informational. Paul is telling us who we are. He tells us in chapter one, he says that, that we have been blessed. Ephesians 1, 3 says we have been blessed, meaning that God has blessed us. Everything that we need to be successful in the body of Christ, everything that we need to be successful in the things of God, God has already given it to us. I, I, I don't need... <laughs> on i don't need nothing else when you when you have a baby uh if, if we have a little boy have a little girl everything they need to be a full-grown adult they've already been born with it but now there's a place that they have to mature and develop to become that full-grown man or that full-grown woman that's what paul is saying paul is in everything when you and i were born again god gave us everything that we need to be a full-grown mature believer in the things of god so he tells us in chapter 1 it begins to tell us who we are and the position that God has given us by the time we get to chapter 2 he kind of unfolds and says that God hath quickened us in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 we were dead quickened means to be made alive God have made us alive when we were dead in our trespasses and we were dead in our sin and we just walked according verse 4 just walked according to the course of this world we didn't know any better we just did what we need to do nobody had to teach us how to sin we just sinned I didn't have to go to sin class no come on I, I, I was born sinning I, I was born that's mine did you did you mess up your diaper mm -mm. who did it they did it come on you don't have to teach your baby how to lie they, they're, they're born to lie we were born sinners and here Paul said because of that verse 8 Ephesians chapter 2 he said because of that he said it's for by grace that we have been saved through faith not of any any man we don't got anything to boast we don't got anything to brag about but no it is a gift of God I want y'all to stay with me don't read on me now because you're going to miss exactly what I'm trying to say here you're going to be you're going to be the first one with your hand up asking questions you reading the chapter read the chapter now read it later uh, so so Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 he says we and I do that because I'm a teacher I'm a teacher by nature come on I'm a teacher preacher I'm not trying to be funny I really want y'all to get what I'm trying to say. I don't want, I don't, I'm not trying to be funny. What good is it for you to sit through a sermon when God is trying to give you a message? Come on, so you're not trying to get through a sermon. God's trying to give you a message, but you'll miss it when you do your own private little Bible study. When I'm trying to give, I already did the study. Just listen. So here, look, look, look what Paul says. Paul is saying that God has quickened us. God has made us alive. We're saved, and God has done a work in us, and God has done a work through us. Then by the time we come to chapter 3, Paul begins to expound on that work. He begins to expound on the work of Christ and what it is that God has done. Let's read that verse again. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 13. You see it? Ephesians chapter 3 verse 13 you see it look what it says it says so I ask you look what Paul says he said I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you Paul said I'm going through some things I'm suffering some things but look at what Paul tells us Paul is saying I'm going through something but what I'm going through is not even for me but Paul says, what I'm going through is for you. Can I, can I tell you, I've already encouraged you. You don't even know it. I've already given you some insight. Don't even know it. That what it is that you're going through is not for you. Whatever it is you're struggling with, you're not struggling with it just for yourself. But you're struggling and going through what you're going through because of the people that God has assigned to your life. You're, not go you're never just going through something for yourself. That's what the anointing of God is for. The anointing is never for you. That if God is gifted you in the area of God have called you in the area is never for you but no it's for the other people God anoints us for the people God calls us for the preacher but God calls us for the people God does the work in us that whatever it is that we do he wants us to be able to bless the people so Paul said what I'm going through I'm going through it for you he said but look he said it ought to be for your for your glory don't don't lose heart somebody say don't lose heart what, what does losing heart mean? It means to be discouraged is what it means. It means to be discouraged. It means to grow weary. Don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't grow weary. And can I tell you, it is so easy for you and I that whenever it is that we're going through, whenever it is that we're suffering, as Paul is suffering and Paul is going through, it is so easy for us to become discouraged. I guarantee you, and I, I guarantee you that there's someone that came into the house of the Lord on tonight, and they are discouraged. 
Uh, they're discouraged with life. They're discouraged with what is going on currently. They're discouraged with their relationship. They feel like their relationships aren't good. They're, dis they're discouraged when it comes down to their financial state. They thought they'll be making more money by now. They're tired of being broke and tired of going through this. They're discouraged about what's going on in their body. But Paul tells us whenever it is that we understand what God is trying to do in our lives, he said, do not be discouraged. How, how, how do I not be discouraged? How do I not be discouraged? Here, I gave it to you right here. Genuine prayer pushes back discouragement. Genuine prayer pushes back discouragement. What, what do I mean by pushing back? You and I, we, as long as we're in this world, Job 14, 1 says, man that's born of a woman, we are of a few days, and those few days are what? Filled with trouble. Jesus said in John 16, 33, he said, in me you'll have peace, but in the world you'll have trouble. In other words, you don't have to do anything wrong, trouble gonna come. You can do everything right, and trouble gonna come. And here, you can be loving God and be on fire for the things of God and discouragement is going to come knocking on your door but what genuine prayer does it pushes back discouragement just because discouragement come that don't mean you wallow in it that don't mean you bask in it that don't mean you stay right there but no whenever it is I spend time with God and I do it for real though it's impossible for me to stay perpetually discouraged when I stay in the presence of God come on here I, I, I know you got your excuses I know but you say but pastor you don't know what I'm going through but pastor you don't got to deal with these kids but pastor you don't got to deal with this and deal with that but no either God line or you line come on here somebody but he told me when I spend time with him he said I don't have to be discouraged I can push discouragement back he said don't lose heart don't be discouraged look what Jesus said he said it as well Paul is just echoing what the masters already said Luke 18 1 he says and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and what not lose heart. This is what Jesus said. I want to tell you to pray. Always pray. Genuine prayer pushes back discouragement. And so if I don't want to lose heart, if I don't want to be discouraged, I need to always pray. Come on, you must not be tired of being discouraged because you're not so discouraged the way you've begun to pray. You must not be tired about what's going on in your life because God is trying to push us to pray. And he says in the King James Version, men ought to always pray that we do not what? that we don't faint and here fainting is a loss of oxygen fainting is a loss of consciousness and what the Lord is trying to tell us today is when I pray for real I'll never lose my God consciousness come on God I'll never lose my God I need to always be cognizant that no matter what I'm going through God is in control come on there are some people that have lost their God consciousness you're going through life like you think Trump in charge no God is in control you're going through life as if you think your body Boss got the final say though. No, God is in control. You're going through life as if you think that your, your blessing and what God desires to do is predicated on a man or predicated on a person. But no, God is in control. But when I don't pray, I will faint. I will lose my consciousness of who God is and what he's able to do. Come on, a person of prayer. I'm always looking for God to move. I don't know when he's going to move. I don't know when he's going to come through. But I know he's going to come through some kind of way. Come on, I don't know what God is going to do in my life. But I know he's going to do something that's what a person of prayer i'm gonna push back discouragement yes i am I, I i'm trying my best here i don't know i don't know y'all 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 came for a little lesson or something i don't know but i came to preach here tonight i came to give y'all and to get y'all the word tonight i don't know i don't know what y'all waiting on look 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 paul picks it up again i'm just trying to encourage you look what paul said in second Corinthians 4 1 he said therefore having this ministry this ministry this man whatever it is that god has called you to do <laughs> Whatever, whatever God, this is what your ministry, whatever God has called you to do. Look what he says. By the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. In other words, whatever God has called you to do, and all of us are called to something. I'm not talking about preaching and teaching. We, we messed up and just feel like the only the called people are the preachers. No, my friend, you called to stand on that door and love on people and hug on people. You called to stand in that parking lot. Come on, anybody ever seen Brother Pompey in, 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 in action? Come on, he called. He'd be backing folk up and be, no, I said, he'll run across the parking lot. Come on, he, he in his calling when he's doing that. Come on, them brothers and sisters that work back there, they called 
called to do what they're doing. And can I tell you, when, what is Paul saying? Whatever God has called you to do, he didn't say that it was going to be easy. He didn't say it was going to always work out for you the way you want to work out. But God said, in the middle of you doing this thing that I've called you to do, he said, do not lose heart. That's what God is saying. Don't lose heart. Don't get to the point to where you are abandoning ship. Don't get to the point to where, listen to me closely, to where you're surrendering to the pressure. Y'all ain't gonna help me now. He said, don't lose heart. Don't surrender to the pressure. The devil's job is to try to get you to quit. The devil's job is to try to get you to walk away. It's the devil's job to try to put so much pressure on you that you say, what is the use? But no, Paul said, don't you succumb to that pressure. He goes on. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. He says, so we do not lose heart. So we do not lose heart. So we do not lose heart. He said, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. See, 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 I, 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 think, I think that someone gave you a mistruth or I believe that maybe you just had a misconception when it comes to God because you thought when you put your faith in God, you thought whenever it is you stopped doing what you were doing that everything was just going to fall in place. No, 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 no. It don't work that way, my friend. But no, can I tell you, in order for your inner man to be built up every day, it's intentional. How do you build up your inner man every day? You got to spend some time with God. You're not going to roll out of bed and everything gonna be alright. You think you sleep with the Bible under your pillow? You gonna learn some scriptures? It don't work that way. I don't care if you put your Bible on your phone and you sleep listening to the phone at night listening to the, uh, to the Bible being read you're not gonna remember. That's not how that works. You got to do some work. You got to plow you got to work and you got to do this thing you got to build up on your most holy faith you got to be renewed every day Paul says the outward man is perishing my flesh is perishing. My flesh is weak. My flesh gonna do it. My flesh gonna do but my spirit man got to do with my spirit man got to do i'm just trying i'm just trying to encourage you look look what else he says in galatians 6 9 he says and let us not grow weary in doing good i, I want to talk to all my 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 my, my goody two shoes i want to talk to all my folk that are doing good. I, I want to talk. I want to talk from from one from one good guy to another good guy. From one good guy to a good girl. Can I tell you that it it it, it, it's, it, it gets a little old sometimes. Always doing the right thing. It gets a little old sometimes always being the one to apologize, always being the one to take the low roll, always being the one to want to reconcile, always being the one that don't say anything, always being the one to not cuss nobody. You be saying, I want to cuss somebody out too. Come on. I'm tired of people just being able to cuss out. I'm tired. I want to I wanna give them a piece of my mind too. Why? Why? I got to always be the one to just hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle. I want to tell the Lord, nah, I got this battle. I want to tell the Lord, I, I, I I got this, this look like a job for me. I want to, but, but can I tell you, Paul is encouraging us and telling us that when you're doing good, he said, don't grow weary. Come on, that's a word for somebody right there. You're doing good. You're serving God. You're praying. You're fasting. You're trying to forgive. You're trying to love. Keep on doing good. Why should you keep doing good? Somebody asked me why. He said, because for in due season, we will reap. When you going to come out in your due season? When is enough going to be enough in your due season? When will God alleviate some of this pressure in your due season? When will you finally get to that next level, that next place, that next dimension in your due season? I don't know when my due season is coming. It's not my job to be able to tell God when to do it. It's my job to be in the right place at the right time when God opened up the door. Is that how? I'm trying my best here. He said, don't, he said, don't, don't, don't. He said, don't, don't, don't get weary and well doing. But in due season, we will reap. But here it is. That's why we never reap. Because if we do not give up, some of us give up. Yeah. How foolish would it be for the farmer to plant a seed on Monday and expect the harvest on Tuesday? How foolish would it be for the farmer to get upset and to go in the field and say, this stuff don't work because it's been two weeks and he had seed in the ground for two weeks. This stuff, they told me if I just, just said it and forget it. 
<laughs> no, this is not an infomercial, sir. No, this, that's not how it works. That's not how seed time and harvest work. But no, can I tell you, I, I will reap. God will give me a harvest if I don't give up. Look at somebody and say, don't give up. Look at somebody and say, don't give up. Don't go. Don't walk away. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up. Don't you quit that job. Don't give up. Don't you leave the ministry. Don't give up. Don't you go to another church. Don't you give up. You got to keep on doing what you need to do because in due season, you're going to reap. If you, don't, if you don't faint, look. Let me, let, me, let, me go to another, let me get another verse. I'm just trying to encourage you. I promise you. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to look, look what he said in th- verse 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. Look what he says. He says, as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. That, that's, that's, that's just about four or five verses I've given you. I could have given you more than that. That, that is, it's perpetual over and over again. The writer is saying, and all of the writers have been Paul. So if somebody know a thing or two about the temptation of quitting, Paul do. And let me say it another way. In order for Paul to write that again and again and again and again, he must have had the temptation again, again and again to quit and to walk away. He, for Paul to tell us this again and again and again, he's telling us no matter what you're facing and going through, hold on. Don't quit. You're doing what you need to do. And I know it gets old. I know that you're under you're underappreciated. I know that you're overworked. I know that nobody tells you thank you. I know that you feel like you do all of this and don't get no appreciation. I know you feel like you're just spinning your wheel and just going around and around in a circle. You take one step forward and life knocks you back three or four. But Paul said, "Don't be weary." And well doing, you, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna reap if you if you don't faint. Let me go back to Ephesians chapter three, verse number thirteen. Look at it from the Amplified. Look what look what the apostle says. He says, "So I ask you, not to lose heart, not to faint or become despondent through fear. Despondent it, it simply means a a feeling or showing extreme discouragement, extreme discouragement, dejection." Or depression. Hmm. We, we're going to be talking about depression and suicide. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of that in 2020 because it's becoming very prevalent in our communities. And one day in time, you didn't hear a whole lot about depression, a whole lot about suicide. But it's becoming more and more real. And the church just can't sweep it under the rug. No, we got to be able to speak to those things. And we have in the past, but we got to continue to speak to those things. And this is what Paul said. Don't become depressed. Don't become discouraged through fear. Fear is the, the land of the unknown. Why do we succumb to fear? Because I don't know what's going to happen. I want to be in control. I want to do things the way I desire to do them. But Paul said, don't you, don't you be discouraged. Then he says, not what's going on to you. Paul said, don't you be discouraged about what's happening to me. Isn't it amazing how most of our stress is not about us? <laughs> Our stress is about the persons that we love. Uh, our stress is not so much about I'm going through. Come on, anybody like me, I can eat poking beans and hot dogs every day. Come on. Uh, it's not me that I'm worried about. I'm worried about my babies. Come on. It don't take my, I'm low maintenance. I'm low budget. It don't take a lot to make me happy and make me satisfied. Come on, I can make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But it got to be right, though. You got to have the right amount of jelly on there for the uh, uh, appropriate for the peanut butter. You can't be having all that jelly. I ain't making a sweet sandwich. I'm trying to make a peanut butter and jelly got to be right. Just can't be slopping it on. It got to be right. It got the consistency. It got to be right. So every bite will uh, be good. So, so, <laughs> so <laughs> what God desires to do is that he, he desires to mature us even when I'm content with my peanut butter and jelly. I'm content with my noodles and no- my oodles and noodles. I, I'm, I'm content with my Roger Woods. I'm content, but it's the people that ha- I felt that I felt that right over in here, right over in this area right here. I, felt, I said Roger Woods and they quicken. I they felt something right then. I, I, I felt that they felt that and they shot na 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 na. Look, 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 let me tell you. <laughs> so we, we can be content, but it's my baby I'm worried about. I can be all right, but I'm worried about my grandchild. I'm worried about this person. I'm worried about that. But Paul said, don't lose heart because of what's going on in the life of people that you love. And here, this is what he's doing. Paul is telling us that he's going through. I'm suffering for you. Yeah. And look, this is, what, this is what helps us. Look at my next point here. Genuine prayer gives me a proper perspective about suffering. It's what genuine prayer does. Genuine prayer Helps me to push back discouragement. And genuine prayer gives me a proper perspective about suffering. So if you don't spend any time with God, 
you view your suffering as if God is doing you a disservice. If you don't spend any time with God, the way God can reveal to you the purpose, there's a purpose for your pain. There's purpose for your struggle. There's a reason why you're going through what you're going through. But if you don't spend any time, all you see is a hurt. All you see is the hits that you're taking and the blows that you're taking. But God is saying, I want to give you a proper perspective about your pain. If you knew what it was that God was trying to work in you and trying to push you to, maybe you wouldn't complain so much about the suffering. If you knew what God was trying to do, maybe we wouldn't complain. And Paul said, I'm going through this. I'm going through this for you. And what I'm, what I'm going through is so real. And it's so, it's, so, it's, so, <laughs> it's so potent what it is that God wants us to want, to want to do in your life. Look what Paul says in chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, for this reason. I'm talking about prayer, y'all. Paul, Paul said, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. God, God, God tells us through the apostle Paul. Paul said, hear me, so this is going to be one of the best things I say all night, I promise you. Paul, Paul says that the potential for you to miss what God has for you by quitting is so important that God pushes me to prayer. Come on, man. Y'all, y'all, y'all going to miss it. Paul, Paul, said, Paul said, if you quit, you're not going to get what you need. And so, 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 so Ephesian church, you're not going, I'm not telling you to pray for yourself. I'm going to pray for you. Oh my God. The weight of the pressure is on Paul. So the way it pushes him to pray for the people, he said, I'm going to bow my knee down. Oh, come What am I trying to tell you? There are some people that are dependent on your prayers. There are some people that are dependent on you standing between the porch and the altar. There are some people that are looking for you to stand in the gap. Ezekiel said, I sought for a man that was standing in the gap. I sought for a man that'll make up the head oh well, I'm going to be teaching on intercession coming up soon because intercession do you know intercession can save an entire city do you know intercession can save an entire family that you know if you pray for real though that God can stop and stay the hand of death let me tell you how important intercession was God came down and was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and God can do whatever he wanted to do he went and talked to Abraham about it and Abraham interceded for the city and said if you find 50 will you kill the city? God said, I won't do it if I find 50. It wasn't 50 there. He said 40 and 30 and 20 and 10. All the way down. God didn't want to do it, but he just needed somebody to stand in the gap. I want to know how much of the stuff that your family is dealing with. How much stuff your children dealing with. How much headache and heartache they're dealing with because you won't pray for them. You won't stand, you won't stand in the gap. You won't get to your knees. You worried about your boo, but you need to worry about your child right now. You worried about your money, but God telling you, you need to pray for your grandchild. You need to pray for somebody somebody online they about to tear that keyboard up saying amen somebody online about to break their phone come on here you'll get that apple care so don't break your phone baby come on can i tell you that god desires for us to pray for somebody somebody else he said he said for this reason he said for this reason he said i bow my knees before the father he said for this reason it's more than just the pressure that they're feeling it's, 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 it's the weight, hear me good, it's the weight of the revelation that God has for him. It's more than the pressure. Paul is saying, hear me, if you succumb to the pressure, you're going to miss the revelation. If you give up too soon, you're going to miss what God trying to do. If you give up too soon, God is coming. God is on the way. God is getting ready to reveal. God is getting ready to promote. God is getting ready to advance. God is getting ready to blow this thing up. But if you quit too soon, you're going to miss what he has. So Paul said, for this reason, in order for you to get this reason, you got to back that thing up. And you got to look a little earlier in the book of Ephesians. Paul tells us what this reason is. Let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. Look what Paul says. He says, in him, he's talking to this church at Ephesus. This is the revelation that they're going to miss. This is the thing that God has in store for them. He's telling them, in him, in Jesus, you also are being built together into a dwelling place. For God by the Spirit. That may seem seem very insignificant to you, but Paul just dropped a heavy revy right there. And Paul is telling us that we're being built, how? As individuals? He said we're being built 
to get her to, to, together. We've been built together in a dwelling place. He's not talking about heaven. He's not talking about my mansion. He's talking about the local church. Paul is saying that you're suffering together, but God is trying to build you together into a dwelling place for God so that God's spirit can dwell. That's one of our, that's, that's a part of our vision. We want to cultivate an atmosphere that the spirit of God can dwell. That's a part of our vision for our church. Because can I tell you, just because you have the name church on the outside of your building that does not guarantee God coming in that's because you have a cross on the top of your building that don't mean God coming in but the atmosphere got to be conducive to where the spirit of God can dwell and when his presence is there's peace where his presence is there's power and here Paul saying we're being built together but if you if, if you miss if you miss the building together part if you miss the building together you're going to miss the dwelling place that he has for the spirit but he goes on further and says in chapter 3 verse 1 he says for this reason Notice, notice that he says for this reason in verse one and says for this reason in verse 13. He said it wasn't verse 13, it's verse 14 rather. He says, for this reason in verse 1 and for this reason in verse 14. So what, what, what's the significance of this? Paul begins to tell them, like he said in verse 14, I bow my knees to pray. But he before he said that, Paul kind of does like a good preacher does. Paul is about to say what he's about to say. And then he inserts something else and then he comes back and picks up his thought. He's about to tell them for this reason I bow down my knee, but then he stops and tells them why he's going to build. Why is he going to? Why is he going to bow his knee down here? It's going to be real good. Don't miss this, y'all. What am I thinking? I need my thinking people. What am I thinkers? At? I need my thinkers. Put your thinking caps on. I need you to get this. Look what Paul says. For this reason, verse one. For this reason, I Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Mm. Uh, look, look, look at what Paul is saying to us. He's saying, uh, first and foremost, <laughs> this, this kills and debunks our narcissistic attitude, thinking that I just got to get my stuff. I just need to be, I need to get my calling. I need, I need my time. No, Paul says everything I'm going through, he said it's for the other people that I'm serving. And this is what Paul continues to say it again and again and again. And he says, I'm a prisoner on behalf of you Gentiles. What's a Gentile? Anybody that's not a Jew. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Can I tell you that we majority of us are Gentiles. If you're not a, of Jewish descent, Jewish origin, all of us are Gentiles. So Paul says I have a message for the Gentiles and that's you and I. Verse 2 says assuming, look what Paul says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for who? For you. Well, look what Paul says. I'm assuming that you've heard of the stewardship or the managing of what God has given me. Paul is saying, God has given me something for you. God has given me, I'm assuming you know that. Paul is saying, why, why is Paul assuming that they know this? Because Paul spent two years with them and they know that Paul is a man of God. They spent this time with Paul and they, when Paul was getting ready to leave, Paul had put enough time, enough equity in, their, in building relationships with them that Paul said, I know you know I, I'm, I'm assuming you know that God has given me something for you. He says the, the grace that he's given me for you. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, here it is, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. God, God has given Paul a mystery. Somebody say, ooh, a mystery. Ooh. God, God, got a, God got a mystery that he's given to Paul. Look what he says. As I have written briefly, I told you a little bit about it, but he's getting ready to expound on it. Verse 4, he says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the ooh, mystery of Christ. Verse 5, he says, which was not known, he said, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Paul is saying, this thing that I have for you, no one else knows about this. What I have for you, it was veiled. It was hidden from previous generations, and God has chosen this generation to reveal it. Who, you want to know this mystery? You want to know the mystery? Let's keep reading. Verse 6, he says, this mystery is that the Gentiles, who are the Gentiles? Who are the Gentiles? Us, us, us. We're, we're the Gentiles. He said, this is a mystery that the Gentiles, you're going to miss the opportunity to get happy. <laughs> he said, the Gentiles are fellow heirs. There we go. And the Gentiles are our fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through 
the God, th this, is what, this is what God is saying to us. This is the mystery, you all. You, this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the mystery that was veiled and that was hidden throughout generations was the mystery of the local church. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. They can come into the body. He said, I'm fellow heirs with the chosen people of God that are the Jews. The Jews throughout all their history, they had a monopoly on the things of God. He came to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, and it was the chosen people of God, the people of Israel. But what God did when he sent his son to die on that cross, can I tell you, he leveled the ground at the cross. So here, the religious folk, the people that know God, the people that have the Torah, the people that have the Old Testament, the people to have the word they got to come by the cross and the people those of us the gentiles away from god we got to come to the cross so there's nobody that has a corner on the things of god there's nobody that has more of a claim or a sense of entitlement to the things to the things of god so i don't care if all you did was steal a pack of bubble gum you got to come by the cross i don't care if you killed 10 people you got to come by the cross i don't care if you never talked back to your mama you got to come to the cross i don't care if you if you walked away and did all kind of stuff that you can do to get away from from people you love we all got to come to the cross there's a level ground that ought to make you happy right there oh because can I tell you that at the cross my God at the cross is where I first saw the light and I heard one old song say where the burdens of my heart rolled away come on here somebody can I tell you it was there by faith that I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day come on y'all go help me here can I tell you it doesn't matter what you going through doesn't matter what you face saying it's at the cross the level ground at the cross I'm an heir everything that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ it belongs to me oh come on here somebody this is what the, this is the beauty of the body of Christ because here it doesn't matter where you from it doesn't matter if you white if you black if you red if you purple if you polka dot if you stripe if Jesus Christ is your Lord then you're my brother come on here somebody if Jesus Christ is your savior and he's my savior you my sister it doesn't matter we may look different you may, you may come from a, a family that has a whole lot of wealth and I may be on welfare but my friend you my brother and you my sister you may have more letters behind your name come on here than M and L O P but can I tell you I may be uneducated but you my friend you my sister and you my brother you may have a PhD and I got a GED oh but we're brothers and sisters in the things of God can I tell you we're a part of the body we are fam we, we, we family we part of the of the body of Christ. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, just trying to encourage you. Let me get out of here. Give me a little, little lesson. Just trying to give you a little lesson. Trying to, trying to, just trying, just trying to do a little. Paul said, <laughs> look, Paul said in verse six, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. That's us, y'all. That's that's you and I, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through. Through, through, through the gospel. So they heard the gospel. I heard the gospel. We all heard the gospel. And we get the promises as a result of the gospel. Verse 7. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. He says, of this gospel, I was made minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Verse 8, he says, to me, though, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 9, he says, and bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the ooh, mystery, hidden thing, hidden for ages in God who created all things. Verse 10, so that through the what? Through, 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 through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Here lies the purpose of the local church. This is why the church need to be praying. This is why we need to be praying together because God has given us the responsibility to reveal to him the mysteries, uh, the, the manifold wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God, the multifaceted wisdom of God. It's our responsibility to reveal that to the world. Come on, what am I trying to tell you? That the world is looking for us to, for answers. And here we're so busy trying to go to them and try to get some answers. 
and we're so busy trying to go to them and try to figure out what's this and what I'm trying to live my life based off what the culture is but the culture shouldn't define what the people of God are doing the people of God should define what the culture is doing come on we always swim upstream we always should go against the grain oh the earth Paul says in Romans 8 the earth is groaning for the earnest manifestation of who the sons of God really are the earth is looking for us oh come on you've been on that job and people have pulled you and come and say they can come here you don't mind you mind praying for me I just found out the doctor saw something you didn't even know they knew you were saved but they've been watching you I got to feel like somebody's watching come on here hey they've been watching you oh they see you against this with your bible they see you on the on your listening to your your favorite preachers don't tell they see that you love the lord but they'll pull you to the side say you'll pray for me i need a scripture i need a word because they're longing they need the mysteries of god oh my friend i'm trying to tell you this is why we need to congregate this is why we come together he goes further verse 11 this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in christ jesus our lord verse 12 in whom we have boldness and access access boldness access i can come before the throne of grace i can come into his presence to pray and talk to him with confidence through faith in him so i ask you verse 13 not to lose heart over what i'm suffering for you if you lose heart you'll miss this mystery that god is trying to show us and here god is showing us and god is saying something to us he's saying paul 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 has an understanding of something that we miss all the time paul is saying man i'm going through to help i'm going through to promote this mystery to promote what god wants to do in their life and listen to this quote i gave you god didn't add another day to your life because you needed it but rather because someone needed you God is not God is not answering your prayer because of you. Come on here, because you I did I, I did everything I was supposed to do. It ain't got nothing to do with you. But somebody need that word that's in your mouth. Somebody need that testimony. Shame on you for not sharing your testimony. Shame on you for seeing someone crying at work and water welling up in their eye, and you don't go to them and say, Do you mind if I pray with you? Do you mind what's wrong? Can you I'm not trying to get in your business, but can I can I you mind if we can talk together? Shame on you if you just see someone hurting see someone down and you not take the time you're so busy with your own life that you don't reach out and help somebody shame on you to be so wrapped up in your own bills and wrapped up in your own life when God has put something in you to help somebody else this is what we're here for Gen genuine prayer clarifies God's plan for our lives that's, that's, what, that's what genuine prayer does it, it clarifies God's plan for our lives that's, that's what gen, genuine prayer clarifies yes yes it does it, god god gives us clarity about his will god gives us clarity about what it is that he desires to do in our lives there, there's someone i guarantee you that is searching right now and someone i guarantee you that that needs direction in their life there's somebody right now, listen to my voice, someone online, someone needs clarity about God's will. What's their next move? Should I step up? Should I step back? Should I stand up? Should I sit down? Should I go? Should I stay? They want clarity. You want to know how to find clarity? Talk to God. You, you, you want to know how to find clarity? Don't go to God with your preconceived notion. This is how you get clarity. You don't go to God asking him to do this for you. You go to God saying, God, let your will be done. This is how you get clarity. You don't go to clarity and say, God, I want this. God, I want to do this. God, move for me in it. No, that's not how you go to God. You go to God and say, God, whatever your will is, God, I'll do it. Come on, I wish Isaiah was here. He'll tell you. He said, send me, Lord, Isaiah 6 and 8. He said, send me, Lord, I'll go. And that's what our desire must be when it comes to God. Uh, say Lord whatever your will is give me clarity and I promise you he will but we're not hearing him because we're not hearing what we want to hear <laughs> and so because, because I'm hearing what I don't want to hear I'm not hearing it but God is talking to us he's talking to us so Paul said because of this for this reason verse 14 again I, I bow my knees before my father I bow my knees before my father I bow my knees before my father genuine prayer here it is, should be so passionate that it pushes me to the proper posture. 
With all that verse of love, appreciates on the south side, and they're going to throw their paper at me. I promise you, they're going <laughs> to, can I tell you, that genuine prayer should posture me in a way. It should be so passionate. Y'all bump, bump that up a little bit. They, they, I'm about to freeze them out now. They, bump that, they, they, they were fanning earlier, but now they, they cold now. So, look, amen. Je, je, amen, amen. They're all up on the wall. You're going to get on the wall. The further away I get from that air over there, the, 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 the warm out. You, you, I be seeing y'all. Y'all be switching seats. They, they start over here, then they go over there. They were like, they be running from that air. Come on here, somebody. They be running from that air. That would that be right there. <laughs> Can I tell you? G genuine prayer should be so passionate <laughs> that, that, that it pushes it. It ought to push me to the proper posture. But, but what does that mean? That simply means that things can be so real in your life that it's not that you need to pray. You got to pray. <laughs> Come on, somebody. God, God will allow some things to jump off in your life. It's not prayer should not be an option. Prayer should not be just something that you do recreationally. Prayer should not just be something that you do to pass time. Prayer should not be doing, you shouldn't be doing it out of duty, but you should be doing it out of devotion. And can I tell you, trouble can come your way so that it'll push you into prayer. It'll push you into a posture. Though not where you're bowing your knee, but you're saying it's not so much of the position that you pray. You can pray on your knees. You can pray sitting. You can pray laying prostrate. You can pray riding in the car. You can pray washing dishes. You can pray vacuuming. You can pray. The posture is not the purpose, but the posture, it matters about the posture of your heart. And Paul is saying, I bow my knee. I'm being reverent to you, God. Paul is saying, I'm dependent upon you, God. Paul is saying, I'm humbling myself before you, God, because if you don't move, God, it won't be done. God, if you don't heal, it won't be. we won't be healed. If you don't deliver, I won't get a deliverance. So I bow my knee to you, God. I bow my knee to your servant will. I bow my knee to you, God, because your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. As far as the heavens are from the earth, so are your thoughts and my thoughts and your ways. My, I bow my knee, God, because there's there anything too hard for you. I bow my knee, God, because you're able to do something that I just can't do. I come to you, God, because I need you. Well, I'm preaching tonight. I'm preaching tonight. I'm preaching tonight. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Let me, let me keep going. Paul says, for this reason I bow. It pushes me to prayer. Verse 15, he says, from, from, from whom every family we're at in heaven and on earth is named. This, this, pa this passage, this mystery that Paul is unfolding is about the local church. And here, this is a reference to what the theologians call the universal church. The universal church is everyone that's ever put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ from, from past all the way to the time he crashed the cloud. That's why he says the family in heaven and the ones on earth. Who's, who are the ones that's on earth? We're the ones that's on earth right now. He didn't, he's not talking about everybody because if you're talking about everybody, he'll say in heaven, on earth, and in hell. They're not a part of the universal church, the global church, the body of Christ. And here, this is what he's saying. It's about us being in family. And I just really, I'm going to stop here just for a second. And I'm going to tell you, this is why the church is lost, losing and, or seemingly losing its posture and seemingly losing its motivation and esteem because we're so busy fighting against our own families. Come on here, somebody. We're family members. You're my sister. You're my brother. We're family. Come on here. I would expect you to be cutthroat on the job. I'll expect you to want to undercut me to get my position and to get my window seat. I'll expect you to cutthroat me to be able to take my spot and try to be able to undercut me. I'll expect that in the world, but we should not do that when it comes to the house of God. Oh, can I tell you, so often times, we, we more gangster than the world in the church, and it's all over sea. It's all about what he said, and she said, and I thought that I heard, oh, no, we shouldn't be cold-blooded because we're, we're, we're family. What sense does it make for you to be in a family and you not protect your family. What sense is it to be being the family and for you not to fight against your family? Here, come on, we, we part of we part of the family. But, but some of us, our families are so dysfunctional, we don't know what a real family shows look like. Amen. Let me keep going. That's a uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, no, that's whole nother message, whole nother time. That's dysfunction 101, not prayer 108. Let me keep going. I, I, Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 16. Is anybody getting anything from this tonight? Or I'm just <clears throat> Look what he says, verse 16. He says, that according to the riches of his glory, here it is, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. Mm -hmm. Strengthened with power through his spirit in, in your inner being. Paul, Paul says, my prayer for you is that God will strengthen you with power. G genuine prayer, hear me, y'all, produces strength. <laughs> 
G- genuine prayer should produce strength. Genuine strength. It does not a should. When you're praying in a pure and a genuine way, it will produce strength. Come on, I know you're weak. I know you, I know your temptations are strong. But when you're praying and you're spending time with God, you can have some strength. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is literally saying to the church, he's saying God wants to make you strong. God wants to get, he's, look what it says in verse number 16. He says, I, I, I'm praying that he may grant you to be strengthened with power. You see that? He's literally saying, I'm praying that God will strengthen your strength. That God will give you might. He'll give you some might for your mighty. Come on here, somebody. God is saying that thing that you need to be successful, that thing that you need in order to make it, God said, it'll produce some strength. What does strength mean? I gave you the definition. Didn't it write down your paper? To be made strong. Come on here, somebody. You don't need to be strong. You need to be strong. Yes, sir. Come on here. You don't need no strength. You need strength. Come on, somebody. Come on. There's a difference. I just think you're just a little tougher when you when you got strength. Come on here. I think it's just a difference. There's no difference from strength and strength. Okay, strong and strong it sounds a little, country strong is different from regular strong, right? You say I, I, he, that, that joke, a country strong come on here, that, that means he can pick up a whole car and change the engine with it on his chest. Come on here, somebody that, that's a, that joke, a country strong. Can I tell you that God can make you country strong in the things of God? Yeah, he can. I gotta go, I gotta go. I gotta. <laughs> he said, yeah, he will. Look, to, to, be, to, to, to be made strong, what else? Tough? Is that how you spell tough? I mean, to ask somebody. Is that how you spell tough? Okay, all right. Just making sure. All right. Tough. <clears throat> Enduring. A little too late to ask now, huh? <laughs> Enduring. It just didn't look right to me. It, it, it looked tooth. Tooth. To make you tooth. To make you tooth. Enduring. <laughs> it means to have, look at this, energy or force. You, you, you feel like you just can't make it? I just, come on, it, come on. I guarantee you that there's some individuals feel like, I just can't make it. I, can't, I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. After I've worked all day, after I've taken care of my family, I don't have the strength to keep on going. But this is what genuine prayer, he'll give you the energy. That's what the anointing is. God puts, your, he puts his super on your natural that helps you to do things that you normally could not do. Yes, let me keep going, let me keep going. He, he'll, give, he'll give me strength. To endure temptation and sin. He'll give me strength for my trouble and trials. He'll give me strength even when I have a disease in my body and he decides not to heal me. He'll give me strength to endure it. He'll give me strength for my grief. He'll give me strength for when I lose loved ones. He'll give me strength for my problems and my circumstances. Genuine prayer produces strength. Look what he says again in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. That means he's giving me strength. He's giving me strength for my strength. Paul says another place, Ephesians 6, 10. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power. Power of his might is not by power, it's not by might, but it's by his by his spirit. Look, look what it says in verse 16. Again, I love from the message translation. He says, So this is gonna be a good verse. Look at this. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life. Not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. The more trouble you experience, the more grace God reveals. Come on, the more things you see, this is the more grace God is trying to show you. God reveals his grace through what it is that you're going through. So you're either descending or ascending every day. You're either growing or... Or dying every day. But the, 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 the ball is in your court. Verse 17. I'm almost done. Verse 17 says. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. This, this, is, what, this is what the apostle says. He says I, I'm praying this. I'm praying that you get some strength. Because you need strength. That where Christ can dwell in your heart. G- genuine prayer produces not only strength. But produces space for Christ to dwell. Genuine prayer pushes out all of my selfishness. And pushes out all of my sin. And pushes out all of the foolishness that I'm so used to. That where Christ can dwell in my heart. What does dwelling mean? It means it means inhabit. It means to live in. It means to be a permanent dwelling. It means to enter in and to settle down. 
and to take, take residence. And, and oftentimes in our lives, Christ is, the question is not whether or not Christ is living in our heart. The question really is, is he comfortable in our heart? It, it's, not, it's not whether or not he's in, your, in the heart. He, say, he says this, that, that he may, that, to dwell means to settle down. I, to dwell, I, 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 I tease my wife all the time. She always, I'm so tired. When I get home, I'm going to bed. I'm going to bed when I get home. I'm tired. I'm tired. And 2 o'clock in the morning, she cleans up. She washes up. It's 4 o'clock. And she vacuuming and wax on. Wax on. I said, I thought you was tired. Come on here, somebody. And there's just something about the wives. There's something about the mama that they just can't go to bed with the dishes. Come on in and say, they can't go to bed with trash. And they can't. Come on, somebody. The trash is going to be there. It's not going nowhere. It can stay in there one night. Come on, somebody. I go walk past. Come on, I'm a guy, I like things right, but I got a cutoff time. Come on here, I got a clock out time. I clock off after the, after the while, them dishes gonna be there. Come on, that's why we got paper plates. Come on here, somebody. Come on, them, them, them dishes gonna be here. We got, we, we, we good, we gonna be able to eat. Come on here, somebody. So, but it, but they just can't sit down. Come on, well, well, you just can't sit down or sit down. Come on, I feel like you just can't, just can't get no satisfaction. And here, this is what, this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus want to sit down and want to relax, but he got too much cleaning to do. He said, you still, you still cussing? No. I'm trying to, hmm. <laughs> Jesus said, oh, oh, we going swimming today? Is that goose? <coughs> it's a fire. It's a fire. No, one, it's not a fire. <laughs> you got Jesus stop dropping and rolling that's what I want to know you got Jesus he's in my heart come on y'all know that's play he in my heart but is he comfortable he's in my heart but is he at home or is he always having to clean up what you messed up and he keep on starting your life over Look, I gotta go. I ain't got time to play with y'all. Look, I gotta go. I'm getting up on my time. I getting up. On J- 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 Jesus wants to dwell in our heart. That's, man, come on, He can't dwell in my heart with all that bitterness. And, that, and I'm making, I'm making, I'm, I'm trying to give you a little sugar with this medicine. I'm making a little, trying to make it comical, but you get my point. Come on, you get my point. Here, here, my, my heart has to be to a point to where Jesus is comfortable in my heart. That he may dwell, and He says that not only, not only dwell in my heart, but He says be rooted. Say rooted. And grounded in love. So, so what else genuine prayer? It produces stability. Yes, it does. Rooted. I, I told you a few weeks ago, either you're rooted in the things of God or you're potted. Some of us are just simply potted. Transferable. But when I'm rooted, I'm stable. When, when I'm rooted, I'm established. <laughs> When I'm rooted, I'm, come on, I'm fixed to the ground, and I'm planted by the rivers of living water. And he says, in my in due season, I'll, I'll be able to bring forth fruit, to be grounded, to be strengthened, the foundation. You get my point. Here, genuine prayer brings stability. I won't be in and out and up and down and this and that, but no genuine prayer brings, brings stability. Verse 18, may have strength to comprehend. Look what he says. I want you to have strength to comprehend with all the saints. What is the breadth and the life and the length and the height and the depth? Paul says, I need strength to comprehend. Mm. He, he says, my prayer is to give you, God has something for you so big, so major, that you need his strength even to be able to understand it. That's, that's what genuine prayer does. Genuine prayer increases my ability to understand that God, to catch something. To overcome something, to attain something, to win at something, to lay hold. Can I tell you that God is trying to give me understanding, some understanding that I didn't go to school for. Understanding that I didn't do all of the hours of study and all the things that other people did, but God can give me some insight. God can give me some understanding that I can grab a hold to what he has for me. Man, y'all to grab that promise. That's, that's some good stuff right there. Let me, let me bring this in. Y'all getting tired of me. Let me see, let me see what it says. Verse 19, 
He says to know, he says God is so big, the height, the depth, the length, the breadth, to know the love of, of Christ. That surpassive knowledge, I still won't be able to understand at all. <clears throat> that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Look what Paul says. He says that God wants to strengthen my strength, and he also desires to fill me to the full. He wants me to be so full of his love that that's the only thing that comes out. Amen. Paul says, man, God wants to fill your heart. This sounds like a tough task. This sounds like something that, man, I, I can't do on my own. This sounds like something that I just, I don't see how I can love somebody when they've hurt me so bad. I don't know how I can forgive somebody when they wronged me so many times. I don't know how I can put this down. I don't know how I can walk away from that. Paul got an answer for you too. Paul said in verse 20, now unto him <laughs> so when it's too hard for you to do now boy i wish if i had, a, if I had an organ right now i go on and tune up right there go now unto him come on somebody when, when it's too difficult for you when you can't do it on your own now unto him god didn't tell you to do it on your own god didn't tell you to figure it out by yourself god didn't tell you that you got to carry it by yourself is that now unto him who is able my god i can preach a whole message on just the ability of god that god is able where your ability runs out god's ability steps in that god is able to deliver he's able to heal he's able to mend the broken heart He's able to do something in your life that when you thought it was over, oh, when they count, whoever counted you out, you ought to tell them you can't count, baby. Because when you counted me out, God was able to do something in my life that even I didn't think he can do. God was able to do something in my life when I thought it was over, when I thought it was a benediction, when I thought it was getting ready to put me earth to earth, as to as. And God said, I'm able to bring you out. I'm able to give you peace. I'm able to heal your marriage. I'm able to take care of your children. Don't you know they have one old song say, don't you? know God is able come on here somebody he's able to do to do exceeding and abundantly oh my God yeah the last thing last thing we done genuine prayer produces power <laughs> the, the power the genuine prayer the power the Paul said the power that works in you <laughs> y'all y'all miss it Paul said the power that you need is in there Come on, that's ragu. That's the ragu commercial back in the day. It's in there. They say, Where, where's the meat? Where's the meat? It's in there. Come on, somebody. And that's what you want to know where your power is? It's in there. You want to know where your ability is? It's in there. You want to know how you can forget? It's already now under him that is there. According to the power. <laughs> Boy, you preaching. The power. That's in, that's in you. I, I gave y'all the definitions for all that stuff. Y'all look at that last verse. To him be the glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all the generations, forever and ever. So be it. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Give him some praise.